everyone can hear me, but um, if we'd like to um, gather, because uh, this session is about to start after the excitement of our, our lunchtime visitor. Um, I'm Georgina Godwin. Very big welcome to you all. So this session starts from the premise that dissent is a core aspect of democratic values and principles. So we'd like to explore the right to dissent, where platforms and voices and facts and power are all interwoven. Who defines what is the norm and what is dissent? How can fairness and governance and dissent be reconciled? And how does that relate to the theme of the day, which is the politics of hope taking on injustice in the Commonwealth? Well, this is how this session's going to run. So behind me, you see the screen, uh, and uh, that will give you the URL for Glissa, which is this wonderful app uh, that we're using. Uh, and basically, you can ask a question on Glissa, uh, and or you can just approve, or indeed disprove, a question that somebody else wants to ask. And what happens is that the questions are then fed through to me, ranked in order of the popularity that they have already on Glissa. So if someone's asked a question and you definitely like that question to be asked, give it a little tick, that nudges it higher up the ranking uh, and that means that, that it will get asked towards the end of the session. We'll also have roving microphones, so if you're, if you're not um, online then there will be a chance to ask your questions from the floor. And then at the end, the fabulous Mr. G will come on and he'll be conducting a Glissa poll. So today is, is very much an interactive session in terms of technology. So. I'd like to start by telling you something about the building just over the road. I'm not sure w which direction it's in. I think I always, my excuse is always I'm from the Southern Hemisphere, so my ma magnetic north is different, uh, and that's why I have no sense of direction here in London. But anyway, I'm talking about the House of Lords. Uh, so in the House of Lords, the Lord Speaker sits on the wool sack. So this dates back to the 14th century. It was initially ordered by Edward III to symbolise the importance of the wool trade to the medieval economy here in England. And the wool sack was just that, a bale of wool, except that in 1938, someone must have opened it up and they took a peek inside and found out that actually it was stuffed full of horse hair. So it was remade, and this time it was filled with wool, more specifically, wool gathered from every single country in the Commonwealth. Now, I don't know if that wool was integrated and mixed up or if it stayed in its little national bundles, uh, but either way, when there is dissent in the Commonwealth and a country either leaves or is kicked out, uh, I'd like to think that the, the wool stays there. The wool isn't actually removed. So when after much dissent, albeit government versus institution, Zimbabwe, my own country, left the Commonwealth, well, I hope that a, a bit of Zimbabwe remained nuzzled up to the heart of the, the British Parliament against the, the uh, finest strands from the other members. So as a Zimbabwean, it, it gives me great pleasure to feel that although we're not currently members, uh, we are still included and I'm so pleased that Zimbabwe is represented on this panel by my compatriot, Owen Maseko. Owen, thank you so much for being here. I know it's, it's a long journey, and indeed everything that's brought you to this point in your life has been, has been a long journey. Uh, Owen's a Zimbabwean visual and installation artist. So in 2011, he was named by Time magazine as one of the world's 10 most persecuted artists. He was arrested in 2010, less than a day after his exhibition opened at the National Gallery in Bulawayo. The exhibition, Sibetum Sitsvele, Let's Drip on Them, referred to the massacres of Indabela citizens uh, during Gukura Hundi. Uh, that was, Owen will tell you a lot more about it and indeed show you some, some images from that exhibition. Uh, but basically, it was a, a massacre carried out by forces loyal to Robert Mugabe in the 1980s. Owen was charged with various offences and, and will, will tell us about what happened to him after that. The upshot was that the Supreme Court permanently banned the exhibition from being shown anywhere within Zimbabwe, but it has been shown in South Africa and Kenya. And as I say, you'll get a chance to have a look at some of the images on the screen behind us in just a moment. <clears throat> Next up is Pragda, Pragda Patel. She's a founding member of Circle Black Sisters, that's SBS. It's an NGO based in West London, supports black and minority women to assert their fundamental rights and freedoms in the face of injustice and inequality. 
Now, she's worked as a coordinator and a senior caseworker for SBS. That was from 82 until 93. And this is the fantastic bit of the story. She then leaves, goes and trains as a solicitor, comes back to SBS as its director. Uh, 38 years of experience of working on violence against women in black and minority communities. She's been at the forefront of key cases and campaigning milestones in the history of SBS. She's also a founding member of Women Against Fundamentalism and a member of Feminist Dissent. And she's written extensively on race, gender and religion. So thank you for being here. And our final panellist today is Angela M. Kogadas, uh, who obtained her Doctor of Creative Industries from the Queensland University of Technology. She's a Malaysian and a feminist human rights activist. Her interest is in utility-oriented research that can contribute to advancing the human rights of vulnerable and minority communities, as well as the rights of women in general. Angela's worked at national, regional and international levels and she has expertise in training, evaluation, research and strategic litigation. She also specialises in the training of trainers with a focus on gender, sexuality, gender evaluation, human rights and digital storytelling. She's a self-starter and a catalyst. She's the co-founder of Knowledge and Rights with Young People Through Safer Spaces, Justice for Sisters and the University Kaklima. Angela, thank you for coming. And I wonder if we could actually start with you. I wonder, I wonder what was the key moment that made you a dissenter, what your dissent story is? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm an LGBT activist uh, who's quite vocal in Malaysia. Uh, and I work, um, uh, my work includes uh, fighting for the rights of uh, Muslim LGBT something that is uh, not very welcomed by Muslim Islamist activists uh, because they see it as interference. So, but I guess uh, what I wanted to share with you really is not so much about the, the scary bits <laughs> in terms of dissent and you know, how uh, the, states may, the state may take uh, actions against me and my colleagues, but it's more about um, about movement building and uh, how dissent is sort of managed uh, even among civil society in the human rights circle. Um, I think some of the hardest forms of dissent that I face is with human rights allies. Uh, so for example, um, in, in trying to push for human rights uh, based uh, for the LGBT, for rights that are uh, protected under freedom of religion, and for women's rights, uh, especially in the promotion of gender equality, um, there have been uh, some accusations as to like, uh, you are seen an, as an extremist in their eyes. And I find that really interesting because they, they use the word you rather than we. And, um, and so uh, some of the things that get suggested uh, to me and my colleagues who, who are like-minded uh, would be like, um, we should try and work with them a little bit more closely. Uh, we should try and understand their position. Uh, for example, um, they're actually quite agreeable to the ratification of the Convention Against Torture, for example. And then I can't help but wonder why it's so easy for my colleagues to dismiss or overlook uh, that there are elements of torture, some form of torture in the lived realities of people who are struggling uh, for their rights as LGBT. Uh, people who are struggling uh, for the right of apostasy um, if they're Muslim. Um, and for, for a lot of women who are fighting for gender equality, because for these groups, the LGBT rights are not human rights. Um, uh, gender equality shouldn't exist. And uh, well, you know, Malaysia's Islam is a very uh, becoming, it's becoming a very purist Islam. It's a very misogynist Islam and supremacist Islam as well. Uh, no doubt influenced by Salafi and Wahhabi kind of uh, beliefs. The other example that I want to share with you uh, is uh, how the LGBT have become quite visible in one of the largest uh, grassroots uh, campaign for clean and fair elections, per se. Uh, it's become a movement. It's the largest movement in Malaysia. Uh, and as LGBT, we've been in that protest uh, rallies on the streets, um, at least since the second rally. Uh, and I remember the fourth rally had a large flag, a pride flag, um, that you could see at least 200 meters away, if not more. 
and uh, there were protests among the participants and you know who, who went up to the, to the committee members and said they shouldn't be here. If they want to be here, they shouldn't have their flag. And to the credit of the young man that was waving the flag around, uh, this young gay guy, you know, and, and his friends, they, they stood their ground uh, when the committee members came to them and spoke to them. And uh, the committee eventually relented and said, well, they're here uh, for the same agenda, you know, clean and fair elections just like you. Um, but what I found out later was uh, how Berse claimed uh, that space that, you know, where people are on the streets, uh, it's a... It's a reflection of the diversity of the different stakeholders, you know, um, working towards one agenda, no doubt, but also how they've claimed it as a democratic space. And yet, within the uh, processes and uh, in terms of decision making and the committees, they never raised that issue about the human rights of the LGBT and how to sort of reconcile that with their Islamist supporters within that committee or among their supporters, who were one of the strongest supporters. I'm not um, sharing this as um, something critical, but I think it's more about my own reflexive process as to how then do you talk about inclusive governance, right? Um, and a lot of us are sort of pushing towards, uh, more towards elements of participatory democracy uh, where every voice is heard. I know it's, it can be a logistical nightmare, but um, I think uh, with the right to dissent, uh, I think it's important to also uh, remember that there is sometimes a privileging of a voice <coughs> and uh, representation, uh, the way democracy is practiced. I mean, let's face it, our democracy in the most unsophisticated form uh, is about majority rule. And therefore, you know, uh, the numbers uh, speak rather than the minority or, or the ones uh, who are struggling about their human rights the ones who are trying to speak to their lived realities. And sometimes I feel the right to dissent is really the right of the majority. Uh, it's not really the right of the minority because right to dissent suggests disagreement. Uh, you know, and it's not mere, a mere disagreement for us. It's about our lived realities, the injustices that we experience. And uh, it's, I feel like, uh, in that way, then maybe we should even interrogate right to dissent and what that really means for, for us. Yeah, so I just want to stop there. Thank you, thank you, uh, 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 Angela. If we come to you, Pragda, now, and, and, and ask you really the same question, where, where your dissenting journey began and what it is about, about dissent that, that's, that's really motivating you at the moment. Um, well, I think that my journey uh, in terms of uh, my existence as a dissenter starts with my childhood. I think that um, for me, it's dissent is a core aspect of my identity, both as a woman growing up in a community with patriarchal norms and values that I needed to challenge, but also as a minority growing up in a majority society in this country, facing the kind of racism and inequality and discrimination, exclusion, marginalization, uh, that minorities face, uh, ethnic minorities face in the wider society. So for me, dissent was a really critical part of who I was, um, and it was necessary to dissent against the kind of norms that existed both in commu family, community, and the wider society in order to find a sense of myself. Um, but um, so, so for me, dissent, I'm no stranger to dissent. Um, my personal and political life has been built around the core principle of dissent. Um, and I feel the dissent is a necessary means by which to challenge regressive values everywhere. Um, but following on from that, um, in the early 80s, I established the autonomous black feminist organization, South All Black Sisters, of which I am the current director as you introduce me. Um, the very inception of Southall Black Sisters was an act of dissent uh, because we set ourselves against traditionalists and conservatives who sought to suppress women in our communities, but we also set ourselves against the exclusionary and discriminatory nature of the wider society where racism was pervasive and institutions 
uh, marginalized minorities, particularly women. But we also had to dissent against aspects of anti-racist and black feminist orthodoxies. And in a way, I think that comes back to what you were saying in terms of the wider alliances and movements and the space within it um, as a form of dissent. Um, and so we set ourselves against aspects of anti-racist and feminist uh, orthodoxies that lapsed into very narrow and essentialized identity politics. Uh, which kind of denied other power relations and differential access to power within communities. So in a way, for me, dissent is about breaking the silence on many fronts. Um, and for almost 40 years, I have um, worked with others in a South of Black Sisters, which exists as an advocacy and campaigning center to assist thousands of black minority women who come to us in fear and desperation due to violence, isolation, discrimination. And they find that their aspirations and desires for personal security, for liberty, are being squashed by um, both state structures of racism and exclusion, but also increasingly growing conservatism and religious authoritarianism of the kind that you've described actually, that insists on purity and authenticity of identity. And that, only, that kind of um, conservatism and authoritarianism only serves to underpin the agenda of those who seek to control the minds and bodies of women, particularly vulnerable minority women. The next real sort of milestone for me in terms of dissent and my narrative of dissent is 1989 when along with other black and minority feminists, I founded Women Against Fundamentalism and that was an organization that was born in the midst of the unprecedented furor surrounding the Salman Rushdie book, Satanic Verses. And as a member of SBS and Women Against Fundamentalism, I stood in solidarity with women from many religious backgrounds and none in protest against Muslim fundamentalists who called for the death of Salman Rushdie, who was declared a blasphemer for questioning religious absolutism. Um, and what was significant about that iconic, uh, uh, of, sorry, the significance of what is now an iconic Women Against Fundamentalism moment is that with, along with other feminists, we drew connections between Rushdie's right to dissent and the feminist tradition of dissenting. Doubting and dissenting, I believe, lies at the heart of the feminist movement, or it should. And it most certainly lies at the heart of Southwell Black Sisters' brand of feminism. And we see dissent as necessary means of achieving progressive transformation of society. And this is why our placards in support of Salman Rushdie consisted of slogans such as, here to stay, here to doubt. Fear is your weapon, courage is ours. Our tradition, struggle, not submission. It's at that moment that I recognize that these words were the only real weapons we have in our struggle against patriarchal and illiberal identity politics and against the power of religious absolutism. And, and that we see actually on display everywhere. Um, more recently, I founded with other feminist activists, academics, and writers the journal Feminist Dissent. And this journal is designed to create space for feminists who believe that certain approaches currently dominant in academic activists and popular discourses have blocked the challenges that women and other dissenters face. This in the face of fundamentalist movements that threaten women's rights, pro their prospects and their very being. We are, as a collective, we're committed to justice and gathering evidence, expanding the debate beyond the usual social, ethnic, and national boundaries, and asking difficult questions. A dissent is nothing but asking difficult questions, both of ourselves and of our movements and of the wider society. And I think at a time of rising religious fundamentalism accompanied by intensifying threats to civil liberties, freedom of expression, dissent, and difference, what we aim to create, what we believe we need the most is a space where contributors can say things, where activists, academics, and others can say things that we've not been able to say anywhere else. I do believe dissent is vital to creating a strong and vibrant democracy, 
But I also believe that we have to distinguish between those who dissent in order to improve the democratic process and those who dissent to undermine the democratic process. Um, and I, more than anything, I think uh, what we need to safeguard and promote are the secular civic spaces, which are seriously under threat and undermining the very principles on which we want to build a more progressive, transformative society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pragna. Uh, Owen, if we could come to you and, and if you could fill in some of those details about what happened to you in Zimbabwe and, and tell us about your, your descent journey, if you like. Uh, well, uh, mine is a, is a very, it's a, an experience that I had when I was growing up. And descent to me is actually using one's creativity to get the message across. Literally saying that we can all be activists in, the, in whatever we do. It doesn't matter what you do. So uh, basically, um, in Zimbabwe, what happens is uh, uh, we are divided tribally. It was a uh, strategy by the, the, the Mugabe government from since 1980. So the way it was made is that there is the minority tribe, which is Ndevele, and then there is the uh, majority, which is the Shona uh, tribe. So uh, soon after independence, there was the, uh, uh, after independence, when uh, we, everything was supposed to be together. Unfortunately, uh, during that time, I was very small and uh, we were living in a place called Ndumban, which was literally an army base. So we were very small. I think I was about seven or eight years old. And uh, uh, me and my brother and my other, literally two sisters and a brother, so uh, I put a twin brother. So it is happened that I, I think it was between 1983 and uh, 1987, somewhere around about there. The first attack, I think it was possibly somewhere around 1983. Two, two, I think 1983, yeah. so 1982, mm. somewhere around about. So it was one of those moments when you are children and you live in an army base you, I was very good as I'm an artist now, uh, making those little wire cars and you could get some little beef uh, tins from soldiers who were around and we could make wheels from all those things. Life was very simple, yet we did not know that our parents were going through uh, hell with all the, the setup that was there. So one day there was this uh, aeroplane that was hovering up the sky which said, Silicon Jolozele, meaning we have all been surrounded. And within a few uh, seconds, the whole place was milling with the army and people were being beaten up, were being, we were all running around. And I clearly remember my mom calling on us, me and my brother, to pick up our little brother and sister, holding on to them and kind of trying literally everything. I think the sad thing about that is that, uh, you know, when you are growing up, you look up to your parents. Can you imagine watching your parents being beaten up? Your father bleeding, your mother being kicked around, and all these the people that were <coughs> with us. We were so helpless, holding on to each other, and kind of track. And, and I tell you, it was one of those moments where people disappeared, everything happened that very same way. And uh, so, because of that history, in a way, as I was growing up in that very same society, we grew up and I lived there for about 20 years. You could hear families whispering about those atrocities. You could hear people talking about those uh, uh, happenings, but it was all on closed doors. But as children, you start to ask openly and you'll be asked to keep quiet, you start, oh, and then you ask to be, to, to be quiet about it. But as an artist or growing up as a child, it's not a memory that can just go away. So then it happened, uh, as I was practicing as an artist, as I became more and more professional as an artist, I discovered that history started coming back to me naturally. Like, you know, because during that time, a lot of people were displaced, even my own family was displaced, and a lot of people were suffering, and. Uh, all our wealth was gone and everything uh, was lost. 
So in the Matebelelen, the whole Matebelelen region in the little bit of Midlands was totally disadvantaged in terms of growth, development, and, 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 and anything that you can think of that was happening also in the country. And unfortunately, during that time, the world was silent about it, totally silent about it. And uh, even some people that lived in some parts of the country in Mashonaland didn't even have an idea of what was happening because it was the army that was unleashed specifically targeting a particular uh, tribe, which is in Derel. So there was no way, so everyone was shut out of the picture, which is now even at the moment, when you talk about Kukuraundi in Zimbabwe, most Shona people or the majority of Shona people would just say, let's forget about it. But it's not easy to just move on with such uh, memories. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Matebeleland community has always been in fear. Fear was instilled onto us uh, during that time, and uh, this is who we have been. So Mugabe community, Mugabe um, uh, rule has always been a threat to us ever since from that time. Sorry. Alan's wonderful hair is knocking okay. against his microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, OK, that's cool. Sorry about that. Yeah. So it, uh, it happened, and I did an, uh, in 2010, I did an exhibition uh, around Kukurandi, which I entitled uh, Siba Tontisel. So this exhibition, my approach to this particular exhibition, uh, it was an artistic approach. Because I couldn't write, I can't properly write, I can't do anything. The only thing that I had was, which I still have, is my artistic ability. So what I did was I cracked uh, 12 paintings, uh, which uh, I entitled the, the exhibition, meaning let's trip on them. Let's trip on them simply means um, it was a way of reminding, of bringing out that torture. Because during that time, they used to trip hot plastic on, on, on victims. They would make you lie down on the on the ground, and then they would drip hot plastic on you. So that would be siba tondisele. So it was a way, a cruel way, of, or to torture the victims. So I cracked uh, twelve paintings and uh, the installations, which basically uh, you can just run uh, one of the uh, slide uh, pictures. So this one is called uh, Babylon Songs, and uh, one way of totally disempowering a, a, a people or a community is to take away their language. So one of the ways they also tortured uh, people was when they were beating up, this I actually witnessed my parents uh, singing those Shona songs at the same time being beaten up. Even up to today, what is actually happening is that it's, it comes in many different ways. Like if you go to the supermarket and buy uh, milk, for instance, it's a very simple thing, but it's written in that language. And the children, even at school, are being taught by teachers that are from a different region, and they are being forced to, to learn that shown. Even in police roadblocks, it's the very same thing that you actually have, you actually possibly would think that all police officers are shown, but there are some Nebele ones, but they can't practice their language in that, in that uh, police force. And uh, when I did this exhibition, uh, in the opening night, it went well, and the following day, that's when I, I got myself arrested. That was in 25 March in, in 2010. So then within the 40, 48 hours, uh, the exhibition was already shut out. Can I get the, the other slide? So this one uh, depicts, well, the, 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 the methods of torture uh, that was uh, done during that time. If you look at that, uh, the, the one with the parent, so we, we call them Ongwane's bomb, the, the, the army with the red parent. It was the Kukuraundi, which was trained uh, by the North Korea which attacked uh, developed people during that time. And uh, if you can see, there is a, another one, which is very, very, this particular one, little painting on the corner there. So this incident, uh, it's a sad one because uh, one of my relatives, uh, who is a lady, 
I think it was my aunt. Uh, she was asked to put her little baby inside her, uh, what do you call it? Pestle and mortar, what do you call it for, for yeah. grinding, milly mill, which is our, so to crush the baby in that. And later she was shot. She's one of my closest relatives that actually died during that time. So it was one of the paintings that would depict that. And uh, the rest is that you are treated like trash. They just have to sweep you. They just have to kick you around wherever they think they can. And uh, could I also have the, the, the next slide? And uh, this one, it was also another torture where uh, in the rural areas, they would uh, ask the children to come around and hang the teachers upside down from a tree. And they would beat the teacher until to death. Or they would ask actually the children to do it themselves. So it was quite cruel. And uh, what was more interesting about this installation is that sometimes uh, with art, it's very elite. It's for, it's for the people that follow up on art and everything. So where I come from, the Bulawa National Gallery, where I did the exhibition, there is this huge window that, uh, that's on the pavement, that faces the pavement. It was, uh, when I did this exhibition, these uh, uh, figures were actually hanging on that particular pavement uh, through that, we could see them through the wind. It was the first time people actually stopped the pedestrians and actually everyone grouped to actually see these, uh, these, these uh, images. So when the exhibition was shut down, um, these newspapers was, uh, was put on the window by the, by the police. So this is how we got to, when we pictured this image is already the exhibition, a friend of mine did the, the, the pictures, who works at the gallery. So when I got arrested, so I went into my prison cell, and uh, what was very interesting and at the same time very sad is that even the police officers and the prison guard were also divided about what I had done were also shocked because you would get uh, police officers sympathizing with me, that underwele you get the Shona ones being very, very aggressive. So it was, you know, the division was always everywhere about tribalism. So in a way, when I was in, in, in detention, I could easily get protected by those that actually believed what I had done. And at the same time, there were others that were also very aggressive about what I had done. But I had also already created a lot of dialogue because I was talking to the other prisoners who were there for different reasons. And uh, I was also talking to police officers and all that. But the, the interrogations were really terrible because you, you would go in there and they would call you in, you go in and out, in and out. It was quite agonizing. So my first charge was undermining the authority of the president, who was Mugabe then. And then the second one was causing offense to persons of a particular race or religion. So those two each was about a year. Because I was a first offender, it was possibly going to amount to about uh, a, a fine or something. But later, uh, later in 2010, it was later changed to fal falsifying information to incite violence which was 20 years. And I think um, it was hard. So I walked the streets of Bulawayo knowing that I had 20 years on my shoulders. It was. Anyway, so the case went on for about five years until uh, 2015. And uh, in 2015, I had to take my exhibition down, but it was banned. But the unfortunate bit now is that most artists that were my friends totally didn't support me because of fear of arrest and fear of association. And um, it was one of those moments in time where you needed friends and you needed people to support you. But of course, there were family. The family was there to support me, and some uh, civic organizations and NGOs, which was really brilliant. They kept me going, and I was represented by Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, which they really gave me quite a lot of strength. 
So to me, when I talk about this end, sometimes it's not necessarily about reading in the books, it's about the experience that you go through that you need to go to take it out to people for people to to know what is happening in your space and to know what is happening in your country and where you come from. I think at the moment I will leave it up with you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I want to just follow up from that with quite a difficult question for all of us in that Today we're talking about the politics of hope, and of course in Zimbabwe context, and indeed in many countries in the Commonwealth, we're looking with hope. In Zimbabwe's case, there's been regime change, so-called. You and I both know that the people in charge are the people that were responsible for Kukuru Hundi. What do you say to people then who say, all right, you can have blame apportionment or you can have problem solving. We can go forward in hope and try and build this nation, not only Zimbabwe, but other countries too. Or we can carry on dissenting, saying, no, you killed upwards of 20,000 people. Which is it? Where do we stop? When, when, does, when does stopping dissent become unhelpful in building a democracy? I think uh, uh, from an artistic point of view, where I come from, it's, it's very difficult to, without uh, certain uh, policies in place for one to be able to grieve, one to be able to, 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 to be able to get around what actually happened. It doesn't matter what it is because violation of human rights comes in many different forms. So when you look at Zimbabwe now, the biggest challenge is that uh, people or perpetrators of those particular uh, um, uh, killings are still in powerful positions. So how do you get around? How do you start a dialogue about those particular atrocities if the very same person that you are talking about is the perpetrator? Yeah. So I, by, yeah. I, I would like just to, just to, to throw that to you about, about dissent building a democracy. And, and at what point when you when everything in you wants your country to succeed, wants your community to succeed, do, do you stop? And, and what, is, what is the responsibility? If, if, if what you've been dissenting against is then solved, what is the responsibility of the, of the former dissenter? I've not been in a situation where something's been resolved. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really quite hard for me to say that, you know, what would be the next stage? I, I guess dissent is a process and building democracy is a process. And demo building democracy, does it ever stop? I don't think so. Um, because there are always voices that are not heard. There is always that marginalization that exists and there are layers and layers of inequality and discrimination. So for me, dissent must carry on, even as you taste success. Uh, because after dissent comes accountability. And for me, the question is, you may dissent to a point where you may succeed. And in my experience, I've seen how the feminist movement has protested against sexual violence, for example, or domestic violence, and brought about um, a cultural change, brought about Time's Up, the movement Time's Up, brought about um, Me Too, and in other countries brought about, you know, changes in terms of legislation around mm. rape and sexual violence. I'm thinking of India in particular, particularly at this moment in time. Um, so, you know, we've seen those changes, but does that mean you stop dissenting? No, because the question then is, there is a gap between the kind of changes you see and the question of accountability mm. and institutional accountability. So dissent has to carry on. I think that if there is no dissent, there is no democracy. So for me, it's a process that is never ending because the next major challenge is making sure that you are accountable uh, to, the, to the various constituencies and making sure that you deliver what you promise. And there's a huge gap between uh, uh, the promises that are made and the delivery of those promises. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, at least not at the moment anywhere, where we can say, okay, we stopped dissenting and now we need to just carry on. For me, dissenting, the very act of dissenting is the business of building democracy. What would you add to that, Angela? I think uh, there are different ways of dissenting as well, and that tends to change depending on the situation and the context. 
Um, for example, uh, usually when we when we talk about human rights, we're quite specific. Uh, sometimes we can be quite con confrontational. Um, but I've also, um, where we've done research on the violence against uh, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender people, uh, we've actually published a book of stories and sort of left it open for people to sort of uh, decide for themselves, you know, uh, in terms of the lived realities that they are reading and what exactly uh, are we talking about in terms of rights and in terms of uh, the injustices uh, that these people face. Um, so I think the forms of dissent tend to change. Uh, we may not completely agree with it sometimes, especially among allies, um, but I would agree with Pragna, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't, stop, we don't stop because the, there's, no, there's, no, there's still no recognition of multiple truths at any one time. And that's sad. Uh, I, I think there's an assumption that just because you're an elected leader that you have this worldview. But oftentimes we have elected leaders with a single, singular worldview based on a singular lived reality or be, based on a lived reality maybe of their family and that's it, you know, and that becomes their benchmark. I'm going to take a couple of questions from, from Glissa now uh, and do feel free to, to add your questions if you want to and then we'll come, we'll take uh, two questions from the floor. Uh, so this first one, we hear a lot about the rights of LGBT, religious and ethnic minorities. What about the rights of the elderly? Uh, the elderly are one of the most vulnerable groups and the least likely to dissent or protest. Mm. The UK government is driving 500,000 elderly common, Br Commonwealth British pensioners into poverty by freezing their pensions. Most of, that can, most of those can't defend themselves. Is it time the Commonwealth spoke up for them? What, what do we think about that in, in, in terms of, of, of dissent? They aren't probably going to rise up, are they? I, I, think that the, the, I think it's really important that in any kind of protest movement, in any kind of vision of dissent, there is a kind of sense of in inclusiveness. There is a kind of sense of alliance building. There is a sense that we are in this together as uh, oppressed groups. So, you know, whilst we may be involved in challenging things on a sectional basis, be it the women's movement, be it disability movement, be it the lesbian gay movement, we must not forget that we've got to forge alliances with others. So for me, the austerity measures of this country the fact that many, many vulnerable groups have been impacted by that, whether they're elderly, disabled, uh, children, mentally ill, uh, black and minority groups, we've got to find a way of forging alliances. And for me, that's the only way. So although I might be focused on, child and on women's rights, you know, that is not in itself a complete protest unless it is also inclusive of other groups and their rights. And so I think that the question then is how do you create those alliances and forge those alliances and ultimately share a platform where the there are common interests. Mm. And I think that's a really difficult um, thing to do actually. Uh, absolutely. Um, if, if we've got a roving mic, if it could come down here to this gentleman here who's going to ask our, our next question. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Ken Bluestone. I work with um, a common age and age international and it's actually, I didn't write that question in Glycer, but it's, it's picking up on that same theme because in actual fact I'm a dissenting voice, but because the way that uh, the Commonwealth is framing its work actually is not in the spirit of uh, the values that were put forward this morning. Um, a focus on youth is absolutely essential, but a focus on youth that is ex to the exclusion of older age groups, that actually, when you listen to the, what the leaders were saying this morning, practically denies the existence of people in later life. Now, we, of course, we know that that's not the intention but that sends out a very strong signal. And what that does is it obscures the fact that the youth of today, many of them have survived, have gone on to get educations after the HIV pandemic because of their grandparents. And not even their grandparents, their aunts and uncles. It's happening today in Bangladesh, in, in across the Commonwealth, where you have children, younger adults, have to leave the country and they're leaving their children behind. This is completely invisible. 
not only the contributions that older people are making, but also the egregious human rights abuses. Older women are being attacked with machetes because they're being accused of being witches. They're being denied access to property because they don't have inheritance rights. So how is it possible that we can talk about a fairer commonwealth, an inclusive commonwealth, and this, and this is building alliances, I completely agree, but the first step is actually recognizing that there is a place in society for people of all ages, mm. and the way that the Commonwealth is framing its worth, work at the moment makes that completely impossible. So my question is, would you agree that the next Commonwealth Summit, and indeed the work of the Commonwealth going forward, has to have an explicit component that 100% recognizes that older people have value, have a place in society, and have to contribute to this dialogue that we're doing now. Angela. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's great to have a specific topic on, on older people. Um, but I do want to sort of uh, say that whenever people talk about the youth and how important the youth are, I always feel like it's from a capitalistic point of view. And it's just about, you know, labor, right? Uh, I'm one for a borderless world. I was discussing this with Pragna just now. Um, and, I'm, 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 and I propose it because it will sort of subvert power uh, of capital owners, for one. And it will sort of uh, introduce an element of uncertainty so that people don't take labor for granted. Uh, we already know that uh, a lot of nations that are aging actually encourage young people to migrate mm. to, to that country. But it's not because they value young people, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> young people know this as well, you know. They're seen as a commodity. Um, and I think we need to call it out as what it is. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there was another question uh, there, that, uh, that gentleman there. Actually, it's not a gentleman. Sorry, I put my glasses on. The, the lady here. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Sarah Hussain. I'm a lawyer from Bangladesh. I wanted to thank the speakers, actually, for really highlighting the importance of connecting across our different um, different uh, groups and sections. And I wanted to ask you all the question, because you each talked about how, in a way, Democrats who've been dissenters can turn into the ones who then stifle the voices of others. And um, from that context, I wanted to ask you from my vantage point in Bangladesh, um, a question really for you guys to ask us about what the Commonwealth can do. Here we are highlighting all these countries' leaders, but we're not really highlighting how they stifle dissent within their own countries. In mine, for example, there are hundreds of people now under arrest and in detention simply for making Facebook comments about our prime minister who's being fated at this gathering. Um, we don't have much discussion around that. We don't have much information in that in the public arena in our platforms. And I think as a people's forum, we need to have the space to do that. It's great we have the space, but if the space doesn't include those kinds of voices and those realities, I don't think we can have the kind of solidarity we need. So I'd love your comments on how we do that and how we get that on the Commonwealth agenda. I know it's a challenge. Uh, Owen, what would, what would your reply to that be? How, how can we move this forward? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a big challenge because, uh, because all this is very highly dependent on where you come from, like we have said. Because my, my opinion on that is that we need to forward all this to the Commonwealth so that as individual countries with individual challenges, but at the same time have something that is quite common that, that can be understandable at that particular level. So it's quite a, a, a difficult one, to be honest. I don't know if you, you have been answered. I I mean, I agree with you. I think that, you know, this is a really important forum and yet we think talk about people's forum and women's forum. And what struck me coming into this conference today was the way in which um, many people were denied visas to get here. And if that isn't a silencing of voices, I don't know what is. So I think the first thing that we have to do is to be inclusive in who is getting to speak on these platforms and who is getting to participate. And yet again, we see the kind of you know, political reality 
intervene because of the government's migration agenda, which is denying visas to the very people that it, that, you know, s s the Commonwealth supposedly wants to hear from. So I think there is a lot of getting your house in order here to be done. Um, I think the second thing is that we, we have to think more globally and have to try and find ways of connecting our struggles at a kind of parochial local level with what is going on elsewhere and to make those connections in more concrete ways. And I know, for example, um, I have been devastated by the recent uh, series of rapes in India. Um, and I feel that yet there is complete silence. India is a major player in the Commonwealth and yet it's not being held to account for the kind of complicity of the state in those rapes that have occurred and the way in which you have a head of state that is sim symbolizes all that is wrong, all that is contrary to the kind of values that supposedly the Commonwealth should be espousing. Um, so for me, it's about calling heads of state to account within the Commonwealth for what is going on in those countries. Um, it is about activists being able to connect with struggles abroad and with other activists and making sure that those voices can be heard in the spaces that we open up here. Um, I know that there is a demonstration outside Downing Street on Wednesday in relation to the Indian rape um, uh, you know, uh, incidents. And so I think it's really important for people to be there and, and to show solidarity. Um, so for me, you know, if we're talking about reinvigorating Commonwealth, we really need, I think, to start again in terms of how that vision is to be built and who are the people that are con contribute to a more progressive vision of the Commonwealth. I don't see it happening because I think at, a na at an international level, pol politics gets in the way. And so I think, you know, the, the, there are major challenges for us. Well, there certainly are. And I'd like to sort of add, add to that question from, from Glisser. It's the same question, but with this too, uh, saying, is there ever a space for depolarizing relationships with people in power in order to get to a win-win uh, situation? Yeah, uh, it depends on the consciousness um, that, that leaders uh, have grown, right? Um, I have seen some leaders change. and. Uh, even uh, Islamist leaders, you know, uh, but they, they do realize some of the practicalities. Uh, they need to, to win their constituency before they can even speak in government and try to bring about change internally. Um, I, I think uh, this understanding each other's issues is, and really like uh, being very wary about the missing voices, you know, uh, and trying to carry those issues with you is one of the things that we've tried to do um, as, as a movement, uh, especially for us uh, in a coalition where we are working on the Universal Periodic Review. So we always, uh, whenever there are spaces for discourse and dialogue, and not all of us can go because we're not recognized as NGOs, some of us are not registered, some of us are registered as a company, you know. So only those who are registered as society uh, sometimes get to go into these spaces and we try and carry each, each other's issues there and so try to expand the dialogue. So we're always very wary <coughs> about the missing voices as mm. well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're running out of time. Our, our lunch guest detained us, I think, um, although we're obviously very grateful for his visit. Um, so we're, we're going to wrap up now. And I mean, I think, I think what, I'm, what I'm getting certainly a sense from the room is that people are really quite angry with their own governments uh, and, and also that we've got to stop fighting each other. The, the dissent amongst dissenters really is, 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 a, is a big theme here. Um, but if I could just turn to each of you for, for your final remarks. I mean, what would you, you know, the, the, the politics of hope, can, can dissent add to that and add to inclusivity within the Commonwealth? Uh, well, uh, it should in a way, but uh, for me, I think I feel the international community or the Commonwealth in particular has to put pressure on our leaders so that they can be held accountable, they can also face the wrath of law than to allow 
uh, these leaders to still get a funding or any form of money at the same time they are violating human rights along the way. I also think um, the issue of, of tribal differences should also be part of the agenda uh, in the Commonwealth as well because it's affecting all the countries uh, anyway in the world. That's where most of our problems are, especially in Africa where I come from. Angela. Yeah, uh, I think we really need to explore how do we extend vicarious liability. Um, this morning uh, we heard about you know, how pharmaceutical companies in terms of their income is much larger than some of our states. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Uh, and we need to really think about how then do we keep accountable these powers because our states are also losing power. And if we have failed states, then you don't have that whole accountability mechanism of you know, legislative, judiciary, and executive. Like in my country, the executive is actually very dominant. You know, it's, it, uh, it has an imbalance of power. And how do you then work in a system that's already flawed? Pragna. I think that there is hope. I think that the fact that there are protests being conducted by ordinary people around the world um, every day at every level, I think that that is a source of immense hope. And that is what holds all of us to account because what we have to try and find um, a way of doing is amplifying those voices. Um, those protests are going on all the time. They're being denied at state level, at community levels, but they are going on. And we've got to find a way of capturing and gathering that evidence amplifying those voices and providing solidarity. Yeah, absolutely, and it's due to people like you who turn <coughs> out for things like this uh, and those voices that carry on dissenting uh, that, that we can really take on injustice in the Commonwealth and, and give us all hope. Thank you so much to, to panellists Owen Maseko, uh, to Pragna Patel and to Angela N. Krugadas. Thank you. Mr. G, Mr. G is going to come and do a glisser poll with you now. Okay, so. if we could all get our, um, the phones out and open up the, the glisser app and click on dissent. And it should throw up a question to be answered. Is everybody ready? No. Nope. Okay, for those of you that are ready, the question is, dissent is a key democratic value. Do you agree? Yes or no? Okay, 100% yes. I think that's probably going to be it, isn't it? All right? Okay, all right. Unless we have some dissenters, right? You have to say no if you want to dissent. Exactly. Nice one. Okay, I think we'll go to um, question two. Question two. In your country, what's the best way of expressing dissent? If you type one word into the text box. All right. All right. In your country, what's the best way of expressing dissent? Don't. Wow. Facebook. Um, there was a lady there that said that, 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 that about Bangladesh and the, the Facebook. Like, it was a universal sentence that was uh, comment on the life about Christian comment about the Right, well. Wow. Okay, cartoonist. <laughs> Don't gay. Okay, cartoonist. All right. <laughs> Radio. Cartoonist. Sorry, Owen. As an as an artist, would you say um, cartoonist and art is that a a viable way? Obviously, considering that that's what that's the path that you've taken, right? Right. Yeah, go on, speak into the mic. I'm saying yeah, definitely art because it reaches out to quite a lot of big audiences. Right. Media, okay. Yeah, but I, I don't have the technical skills. Okay. 
current marching. I would have thought, yeah, I guess, I would have thought march, be a protest, I guess marching and maybe protest is, is the same. Um, what about, um, sorry, I just want to throw this to the panel, what about like ideas of um, like, you know, like we have over here, we have, uh, what's it called, speaker's corner. Um, you know, like places where people stand up and go on and supposedly, you know, that's the, the allocated place to show dissent. Do you think that, obviously, you'd be, you would be very um, au fait with that, the, uh, the South or Black shrinking, Sisters. shrinking, though. It is, that yes. That space shrinking. Yeah. Around the world, that space is No, shrinking. definitely so. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, fa Facebook and social media. All right. Okay, let me just, um, I think we're, we're, I've got one more thing, what have I got to say? Okay, we're going to go to a break now, um, but just to let you know that at five o'clock we've got some more delegate-led sessions. One is called Challenges to Media Freedom and Accountable Government, that's here in Mountbatten at five o'clock. Another one is called Removing Boundaries, Using Behavioral Science to Address Exclusion, that's in the Wordsworth Room at 5 p.m., and also, this evening, we have the second Commonwealth Writers' Conversation at 5 p.m. That's downstairs in Cambridge, where we've got intimate readings by authors from the We Mark Your Memory, writing from the descendants of indenture. So that would be downstairs. That would be intimate reading. So we're going to go for a short little break before we go to the, the final sessions of today. Thank you very much for taking part in this conversation. Right.